comes rolling. USC Shoah Foundation, my name is Marianne Lair. Today I'm interviewing Charlotte Betty Webb, born Vine Stevens. The date is 25th of October 2017. We are in Whithall and this interview will be conducted in English. Camera's rolling. USC Shoah Foundation, my name is Marianne Lair. Today I'm interviewing Charlotte Betty Webb, born Vine Stevens. The date is 25th of October 2017. We are in Withal and the interview will be conducted in English. Thank you. Camera's at speed. Rolling. Can you please introduce yourself? Spell your first middle and last names. Yes, um, I'm Charlotte Elizabeth, known as Betty Webb. Can you spell your names? What the hell lot? <laughs> yes, it's um, C-H-A-R-L-O-T-T-E, Elizabeth, E-L-I-Z-A-B-E-T-H, um, in brackets, Betty, B-E-T-T-Y, and surname is Webb, W-E-W-B. -E <coughs> what was your name at birth? Oh, um, uh, obviously Charlotte Elizabeth, but my surname was Vine hyphen Stevens. Can you spell it? Yeah, sure. B-I-N-E hyphen S-T-E-V-E-N-S. When were you born? Oh, I was born on the 13th of May, 1923. Where were you born? Oh, it's a little place called Aston on Clun near Ludlow in Shropshire. Can you describe the family you grew up in? Uh, <clears throat> well, I was my parents' firstborn, and then I had a brother who only lived a couple of years. Um, then, much later on, when we'd moved house, um, my sister was born. That was when we'd moved to a, a place called Richard's Castle near Ludlow. Which year was it? As far as I know, and I can't remember very clearly, but I think it was about 1926. What did your parents do for a living? Well, my father was employed by Lloyds Bank, and my mother um, ran a lot of things in the, in the garden, like um, bees and goats and um, poultry generally. What kind of child were you? What kind of child? Child. Um, well, I don't remember much about me until um, I was about four, but I think I was um, fairly ordinary. What was the happiest memory of your childhood? Oh, I think possibly when my my sister was born, because see, my brother had died um, when he was about two, and my sister arrived um, in nineteen thirty one. Uh, obviously much younger than, than I am. Could you describe your education? Oh yes indeed, uh, my education was unusual in that it was conducted at home through um, <coughs> a secretarial system called the Parents National Educational Union which um, my, mother's, my mother was allowed to um, teach me through because she was already the teacher of music. How long did did it last? Did this education last? Um, oh, I suppose until I um, uh, went to a domestic science college uh, at the beginning of the war. Um, I mean, we continued to have lessons of one sort and another until then. Is this when you learned German? I learned German as a child. Um, I, mean, I, I grew up uh, speaking German because my mother had had a very bad experience in the First World War in that she was teaching in Germany and not knowing any German at all. She found that uh, life was very difficult, but she obviously had to learn German, and she did, and then vowed that um, any children of hers would be taught other languages, particularly German, because there was nothing worse than being in a country where you didn't speak the language. What was your first experience of Germany? 
Oh, Germany itself wasn't until um, 1927 um, when I went on an exchange visit to a family to a, a little town called Herrnhuten Sachsen near Dresden and I spent three months there actually living with a German family. When you say 1927, that would have made you four years old, so... No, sorry, I beg your pardon, it should have, I should have said 37, shouldn't I? Yes, sorry. Can you tell us about this experience, you know? Um, yes, indeed. Well, I, I lived with the family and I went to school with the daughters of the house who were about 11 and 13, if I remember rightly. And I went to school with them <coughs> uh, for most of the time that I was in Germany. I didn't know enough German to, to participate in exams or anything like that, but I did um, improve my German, I think, a bit while I was there. But of course it was um, the period when the Nazi regime was building up and um, <coughs> the family were very unhappy about it because they were very religious people and didn't, uh, well, they feared what they saw was coming. Um, at my age I didn't fully understand it anyway. Uh, but I did experience um, the atmosphere, which was that um, before and after every lesson, we, the students were expected to stand up and say, Hi, Hitler. I didn't. I just stood up and waved, sort of vaguely, uh, so as not to annoy the teachers. So you said you went to school. I mean, did you participate in many social activities there? school activities? Um, yes, uh, I remember we, we had some uh, afternoons when we all went swimming and the other thing we did, um, I think the schools were obliged to do that, they were sent off to the potato fields for the children to pick up potatoes and it was on the Czechoslovakian border somewhere, um, very hard work and I remember even at my tender age feeling very stiff after a day's potato picking. Can you tell me about the daughters of this family? You mentioned there were two daughters within yes, the family uh, you uh, stayed Elizabeth with. And Edward, yes, they well they were um, school children of course. Um, I know very little about their um, thoughts about the fact that they had to attend every Sunday morning they had to go to a, a class called um, uh, Deutsche BDM medals, uh, Bund Deutsche, Deutsche medals, which was um, compulsory and clearly um, with hindsight I realise it was something to do with the Nazi regime. But they never spoke about it. They came back after it and, and uh, just did things in the house and wouldn't say anything about what they'd been doing. And the parents didn't ask? Um, I think the parents probably did ask, but they didn't get much of an answer. And that was one of the things that worried them very much. Mm. Do you remember other school friends in Germany? Um, yes, uh, vaguely. I, I don't remember all their names. I remember one <coughs> who was, um, I think, probably Jewish, and her name was Christa Zacharias. And she sort of clung to me in, in a way which I found a little irksome because she wasn't part of the family and um, I've since wondered whether she was trying to um, have a friend in England and perhaps escape. I don't know, this is my imagination, but there was something a little strange about her. What did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I really hadn't any, any firm ideas. It was suggested that I ought to be a teacher. But uh, because of the atmosphere in the country, um, and I was actually at Domestic Science College where we were all listening to the radio, well it wasn't a radio then, it was a wireless, um, and um, every day we'd hear that one of our aircraft was missing or something rather um, frightening like that, and four of us decided to leave in midterm <laughs> and join the forces. And I, I joined the ATS and uh, one of them went into the Wrens, I think, and another one into the Air Force. And that's how it was. We, we were restless 
uh, doing the domestic science course. We didn't feel it was sufficient towards the war effort. So until you joined the ATS, you didn't have a dream of, you know, becoming somebody yeah. or doing something in particular? Well, not particularly. It was suggested, the, the uh, PNEU um, establishment suggested that I ought to be a teacher. Why, I don't know, but uh, I'd already signed the army papers, so I couldn't retract on that. Where do you currently reside? I beg your pardon. Where do you currently live? Oh, at that time. No, oh, no now. Now. Uh, well, I, I, this is my 33rd address. <laughs> I've been around rather a lot due to um, army postings and, um, um, well, choice, I suppose. And then um, the reason I came here was because <clears throat> the house I was living in, in Solihull, was compulsorily purchased by the council. And I hadn't any option, I had to get out. And uh, so I had a great search around and ended up here in my bungalow. Can you describe your neighbourhood? Um, here? Yes, indeed. It's really quite countrified, despite the fact it's only about six miles from the centre of Birmingham. But um, it's becoming more built up now. But by and large, it's a, an agricultural area. Um, but I think because we're so near Birmingham, eventually we're going to be built on. We already have, um, I think it's 169 new houses in this last year. So obviously it's going to be less countrified eventually. Tell us about your professional trajectory. What did you do for a living? Ah, well, <clears throat> um, several things really. Um, immediately after the war I went home to give my parents a rest. <clears throat> and then I, I had a job with Ludlow Grammar School in a secretarial position, um, which lasted a few months. And then I happened to bump into a friend who was living and working near Chester, and um, he offered me a job in a firm of metal window uh, uh, manufacturers, actually. And I was there for a while until I joined the Territorial Army again, and was commissioned into that. And then, as time went on, the uh, army folks offered me a permanent position. So I was um, in the army for quite a long time, um, until about the 1960s, when there was a reorganization of the army generally, and uh, my job ceased to be, and I had the opportunity to come to Birmingham and be the careers officer for the West Midlands, which was a very, busy job. I had uh, stations as far north as, um, Hen um, no, yes, um, up north, uh, Stoke-on-Trent, and down to uh, Hereford, Worcester, Coventry, Aberystwyth. It was a, it was a busy job. My, my uh, main office was in, in Birmingham, which I did for until about 1968. And after that, I um, had a job as administrative secretary to Birmingham Law Society, which was great fun, and, and uh, I was there for um, 16 years. Then I retired in 1986. Since then I've been busier than ever. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Right. Let's go back to 1941. You are 18. What happened then? Well, 41 was the year I, I joined up. And I did my basic training, um, which we all had to do. By that I mean learning how to march and uh, how to address your superiors, that sort of thing. How to wear your uniform. Um, that was six weeks, if I remember rightly. And then uh, the question of uh, which trade do you want to go in for? Do you want to be a driver, a cook, or whatever? And uh, I didn't really know. Um, typical me. Um, but. Um, because I'd put on my CV that I spoke German, I was sent off to London to be interviewed by an intelligence officer. And that is how I came to go to Bletchley. Before talking about Bletchley, I'd like to know what was the event that triggered your will or your willingness of, you know, working for the army, enrolling 
yourself or the army? Oh, well, um, it was the, um, <coughs> the whole atmosphere in the country at the time, um, bearing in mind that um, we were at, at war and everyone in the country was geared up to do what they could to defend the country. Um, it was a, a universal atmosphere, no question about it. We all knew that we should do something to stem off the invaders. You were quite young at the time, 18. Yes, well, um, yes, but not too young to understand what was happening, or might happen. Because at that stage, um, we weren't being... Yes, we had had some bombing, but it wasn't... Um, by any means as bad as it became, eventually. Tell us about your recruitment. How did it happen? How did it go? You said that you had a meeting in London to yes. start with. Yes. Can you tell us about this interview? Um, well, there wasn't very much to it exactly in that um, Obviously, the intelligence officer was trying to find out whether I had enough up here to um, be uh, sent to Bletchley. And uh, the conversation was rather on the lines of, it was in German, um, uh, communication. He, he wanted to know what skills I had in communicating. I mean, it was very simple. Um, well, my answer was, well, you'd either write or you'd telephone, or you'd, because in those days there were telegrams, um, which we don't have anymore. Um, and that seemed to satisfy him. And uh, he said, here you are, is a railway warrant to Bletchley, get yourself to Euston. I'd never heard of Bletchley and I certainly didn't know what went on there. So uh, it was completely in the dark, as most of us were at that stage. So whilst travelling on the train to Bletchley, were you expecting anything? Did you... No, I was travelling blind. I had absolutely no idea. Um, but the comforting thing was that also in the same compartment was a girl who'd escaped from Belgium and had joined the ATS, Auxiliary uh, Territorial um, Service, and uh, she was also, she was bilingual and was also being sent to Bletchley, again not knowing what she was going to be doing. Because that was the thing, we had no idea at that stage what we would be expected to do. Was there a feeling of excitement? Um, in a sense, yes. Uh, I, th I think uh, my attitude, as it always is, take what comes. And so I, I hadn't really imagined anything in particular. I just said to myself, well, you do what you're told, which of course we had to do. When you arrived at Bletchley Park, what was the procedure? Uh, well, the first thing was, and as it happened, it was late in the evening and we were taken straight away to civilian billets until the following morning when we were uh, given the Official Secrets Act to read and sign. Uh, the, the first experience was a rather indifferent um, house we had to live in with uh, uh, facilities down the garden, if you see what I mean. <laughs> because in those days, very few houses had... Uh, had plumbing and electricity and so on. It was very, very, very primitive. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Official Secrets Act you just mentioned? Uh, well, I can't tell you what was in it, but I can tell you it was uh, um, very long and rather frightening in a way, um, especially as we were then, having signed it, we were then told that we must not divulge anything that we saw, read or heard within Bletchley for 30 years. A very long time. A very long time. So I said to myself, well, you haven't any option. You do as you're told. And I'm happy to say I, I think I did. Did you know then what Bletchley Park was meant no, for? No, absolutely no idea at all. No idea at all. In fact, until um, fairly, well, yes, I suppose one could say fairly recently, when uh, we've had the opportunity to go back there and to meet others who were there 
and read the volume of books which are now um, describing everything, um, we none of us, apart from a few very senior people, have the slightest idea. I mean, Baroness Trumpington, in her book, she tells you exactly the same thing. She wasn't a baroness then, but um, she was like me. She was one of the um, junior workers there. All of us in the same boat. We, we met, might not talk about anything outside our own office. So you wouldn't be talking to anyone in the other hut, as we, we call them? Um... Yes, other huts, that's right. Well, socially, uh, we could mix. There, there was a... Um, in, within the main building, the main mansion, um, there were facilities for coffee and, and tea and so on um, at lunchtime. We had a canteen outside the boundary where we had meals, but the, um, there was a... A, a nice a social gathering within the mansion, but there was never any talk of work, absolutely nothing. Everyone was very discreet. Very discreet, yes. You had to be. And what was the life like in the huts? I mean, um, within I, the premises of... I was of... never actually working in the huts. I was fortunate. I was in the mansion in one of the rooms upstairs until much later on when I went into a newly built uh, block um, beyond the fence that's now there. Um, but um, we were very fortunate, those of us who uh, were living in the villages round about, unlike the Wrens who were in Woburn Abbey, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but we did have facilities for recreation, such as a Bach choir, a magical society, which I was a member of, um, a, dr a drama group, a gramophone club, um, a fair amount of sport, uh, tennis and um, um, darts and all that sort of thing, you know, table tennis and so on. So um, from that point of view, um, we were really very well looked after. The only trouble was, of course, um, most of us had to work three shifts. That was um, eight till four, four to midnight, midnight to eight. And uh, that doesn't do your constitution any good at all when you're working all, all night and having to eat during the night. But um, oh, we, we got over it. You, you coped with it. For the young ones who will be watching this testimony and who do not know what Bletchley Park is, can you tell us what Bletchley Park is and was Yes, meant? indeed. Um, it, it's um, actually abbreviated to GC, GCNCS, which is the Government Code and Cipher School, which originally was in London in the uh, First World War. But because of the threat of bombing, it was decided to find somewhere outside London to move everybody to. And it just so happened that the owners of Bletchley Park at the time had all died out. And it was up for sale. And somebody bought it for, I think it was £6,000 or something ridiculous, with its 55 acres. So, I mean, I imagine it's old money, but even so, it was uh, an absolute bit of luck because it's a good 50 miles from London and considered to be <coughs> fairly safe from, from any possible bombing. When you were sent to Bletchley Park, was your family aware of the destination you were no, going to? Absolutely not. We were not allowed to tell anybody anything about it, even where we were. And that was um, concealed by the fact that our post, our mail, was addressed to a, an address in, no, that's badly put, I beg your pardon, uh, sent to London, um, PO Box 222, I think it was, and then a dispatch rider would bring the mail up to Bletchley and be distributed that way. But um, my parents didn't know where, no, nobody's parents knew where we were. And did your parents ever try to find out? Not very seriously. Um, I think they thought I was in London, of course, with the, the postal address. And uh, my father had been in the army in the First World War, and I think he knew better than to ask. I mean, they obviously must have questioned it amongst themselves, but they, they never bothered me with it, fortunately.
What were your first work duties there? Ah, yes. Um, well, I was <coughs> thrown in at the deep end um, with a delightful group of people headed by Colonel Test. Oh, no, he was a major then, Major Tester, who was a <coughs> brilliant German speaker. Um, he'd worked on the continent for a lot of his uh, uh, civilian life and was word perfect in German. And so he did a lot of the <coughs> translating and I think decoding as well, I'm not too sure. But his little group of people um, had to register <coughs> all the messages that were coming in from our signal um, staff around the world. Um, but every message which was in letters or figures, nothing in the clear at all, but we had to register them in date order so that he could call on a particular date at any particular time. Pretty deadly job really, but it had to be done because he, it was imperative that he knew where to call on certain papers, certain messages. You just said that it was a deadly job. I mean, well, it was did, deadly did you, find, deadly did you find it boring? Yes, yes exactly. It was, it, Yes, uh, in a way, but on the other hand, they were quite a jolly. There was four of us, I think, three or four, depended on the work workload. <coughs> Excuse me, and um, a bit of right, light relief. Every Wednesday morning, we had to practice with our gas masks on, and these were the military ones, you know, heavy, horrible things, which uh, smoked up when you breathe, breathed into them. Anyway, ten minutes or twenty minutes, perhaps exercise with your gas mask on but one of the chaps in the office always used to sing in the mood with his gas mask on it's the most incredible racket you've ever heard but it, it was a bit of light relief how many morse code messages did you sort and register a day oh my goodness uh, i've no idea that they, they came in um in general at the rate of uh, well, it would depend, of course, on all sorts of things, but I suppose the maximum was probably something in a region of 10,000 a day. Well, we didn't do them all. There were other departments who had the same job. Can you tell us how many of you were working at Bletchley Park? What was... Well, um, it began with just a few people, probably just hundreds, and ended up with an estimate of 8,000 actually in the park. Uh, but that was spread over the three shifts. But um, probably another 2,000 um, across the world where we had our signal staff. But it, it's very difficult to know exact numbers because uh, we weren't uh, registered in any way. So there was no, no mention of names to anybody. And how many of you work in the department of registration? Ah, um, well in my, my particular room there were just mainly four of us, sometimes three, depended on, on the shift I think. So quite a small staff? Oh yes, um, there were, oh Major Tester had, um, let me see now, one, two, three, I think it was four little rooms. You see this is a private house and I think the rooms we were in were probably servants quarters before we moved in. The, it was very unpretentious and uh, jolly cold too. We didn't have much heating. Well, there was no central heating. We had fires occasionally, open fires. And did you talk about the messages between yourselves or not well, really? No, there was nothing to talk about because bear in mind you're looking at groups of five figures or five letters. With no, nothing in the clear except the date sometimes. How long did you work in this registration department? Um, well, I don't remember exactly, but I was uh, moved down to Hut 4, which is alongside the mansion and is now where the cafe is. Well, you haven't been to Bletchley, but you'll see it when you go there. And I was uh, helping um, um, an officer who was... <laughs> he used to write things out. This, this is stuff that had, been, that had been decoded and translated, and he was... Uh, writing it out and he wanted it typed out. It was very difficult because he used to <laughs> write down the pages people normally do and then he'd turn it round and use it. Because we were very short of paper and had to use every inch of um, space that was clear. Now that was quite fun really. Um, then eventually I was posted to the um, Japanese section in a newly 
built Block F, which is no longer there, but um, there is a plaque to its memory. And um, somebody discovered that I was good at paraphrasing. And that meant um, reading decoded and translated Japanese messages. I don't speak Japanese and I didn't have to decode them. But I did have to paraphrase them for onward transmission to where I know not. I only know that I had to put them into two envelopes, one with a, a, an address which was mostly numbers and an outer address for the dispatch riders to know where to deliver them to. And I was never privy to where they went. And can you explain to us what was paraphrasing for? I mean, uh, yes, the, the point was that if um, you had to uh, put, put into words what you, what you saw on, the, on any message uh, and then put them into other words which meant the same thing but which wouldn't be necessarily and we hope never recognised by the Japs as having been decoded. If the Japanese if, came across, if they came across them, yes, some of yes, them, and that's and right. Yes, I'm sorry, it's difficult to explain um, the, the the rigmarole, but if, if that wasn't clear, I'll try again. It was clear. Thank you. And so, what was the Japanese section like? Oh well, um, <laughs> great fun actually. Um, it sounds a ridiculous thing to say, but it was a. A, a, quite a, a big department and uh, a mixed bag of folks. There were um, some uniforms, some civilians. That's how Bletchley was. You know, you, you, you weren't necessarily all army by any means. And all three services and a lot of civil servants all mixed up together. Rank was not, uh, well, obviously one respected one's boss, but um, rank was not such an issue as it would have been in a normal military unit. Was there a mix of crowds at Bletchley Park? Were there different people from different backgrounds? Absolutely, from, um, <clears throat> well, aristocrats to gardeners, if you like. It, it was a, a complete mix of people and very educational. I mean. Uh, Having been a country girl and living where I did, I'd had no experience of the uh, sort of people I met at Bletchley. An awful lot of um, people came, men mostly, came down from the universities. And I mean, that was an um, education in itself. Well, there were obviously famous mathematicians like yes. Alan Turing and. Well, that's right, yes. Working on the Enigma. Yes. But they weren't the only ones by any means. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, he's always highlighted, but there were many others who were equally important and equally, in, in the end, capable of um, decoding things. In fact, they said that women couldn't do it, but some women did. Three or four, but they did. How long did you stay at Bletchley Park? A big one. How long did you stay oh, at Bletchley Park? Did you stay uh, until the end of the war? Uh, yes, um, well, till the end of the war in Europe. Um, but I was shipped off to America in June 1945 to continue in a Japanese section in the Pentagon, doing the same, same job. And what was the Pentagon like? I mean, what Absolutely was it fantastic. working there? Oh, fantastic. Um, I think, if anything, rather more security conscious than anywhere else I'd ever been um, in that um, you you go well, you, have you seen pictures of it, of it well you understand that you go into a concourse which is fairly open there are shops and uh, I think there was a medical center and a bank and all the rest of it uh, but then you have to go through um, a cordon with police on either side um, <clears throat> to go up to your floor you walked up um, to whichever one, I think I was on um, D, I'm not sure, I can't remember, sorry. And then you had to go through another security procedure to get into your own office every morning. I once said to the girl who was an American army girl, 
I said, for heaven's sakes, you know perfectly well who I am. She said, Betty, i got to do it. <laughs> so every morning we went through the procedure, there were all my details and a photograph and so on. But they were very nice about it, actually. Very nice indeed. And then we had <coughs> um, an enormous uh, place to eat in, and there were 32,000 people for lunch. Americans, English? A lot, yes. And in the centre of the Pentagon, I think it was about seven or eight acres, huge, huge place. And uh, when General Eisenhower finished his uh, duties in Europe, he came over into uh, the Pentagon in a tank with an entourage of soldiery of one sort or another, so we were all able to see him and cheer him on for having stopped the Euro war in Europe. I remember that very vividly. I also remember the heat. It was terribly hot, 100, deg 100 degrees very often, and very wet. And there were not, I mean, one was very wet. Um, there weren't many places in Washington that had air conditioning. The Pentagon did inside, but um, where we lived in a hotel, in uh, uh, the Cairo Hotel on 16th and Q in Washington, um, there was no um, air conditioning, but a great many cockroaches. We what was your, I mean, that was your first experience? That was it? my first experience of America. We had to kill the cockroaches before we could go to bed. <laughs> so, how did you, what was your vision of America then? I mean, how did you, how did you see America? Well, I saw it as a, as a very much larger place than I'd ever seen before. I, I hadn't travelled, I'd only been to Germany. And um, I suppose it was rather breathtaking, really. Uh, um, Washington is huge, uh, all the buildings are enormous, and uh, the crowds are enormous, so a bit overwhelming, I think, is my um, main impression. Uh, but very interesting, I mean, different types of people and so on. And of course, in those days, um, the coloured um, fraternity had to sit in the back of the bus. I mean, that was still on when I was there. Um, they didn't seem to, to mind, they accepted it. I found it very strange, especially as quite a lot of um, Jamaicans had, had been in, in, London, in England uh, in the ATS. And I knew some of them. Um, it seemed very strange to me that they would, they should be segregated in that way. But uh, that's how it was. And whilst working at the Pentagon, I imagine you had the chance to mix with your American colleagues. Yes, we did. Yes, uh, we did. We well, we worked them, with them and and mixed with them socially. Yes. Um, quite a nice bunch. We had parties from time to time and uh, I got to know one or two of them quite well. And actually the uh, the girl who had to uh, check my details every morning uh, lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and she invited me for the weekend to spend with her family one time, which was very nice. And it was um, autumn time and New England in the autumn is very pretty. So I had a very nice weekend there. Um, the only drawback, um, no, perhaps it wasn't a drawback, it was an eye-opener that one or two people, although I was in civilian clothes, once they knew I was English, they weren't, one or two of them weren't all that keen. They obviously had some preconceived idea, I suppose, that um, this is supposition on my part, but I think they felt that um, we, the British, had perhaps dragged the Americans into the war. I don't know. I, ne I was never able to justify that thought, but um, it, it existed, this slight um, coldness towards me. In a way, did you feel rejected? Mm, yes, I, I didn't worry about it too much. I mean, I was with this nice friendly family and it, it was a, a short-lived th thought, really. When did you leave America? Ah, 
I think it was October. We had uh, a long wait getting back. So the war ended on August the 9th, as far as um, Japan was concerned. But there was an awful lot of clearing up to be done. But the main difficulty was getting a passage home. Um, that was still difficult, uh, partly because of availability of vessels and partly because I think um, they told us that there were probably still bombs in the ocean. So obviously it was a bit tricky. Uh, it took us four days from New York to Southampton. If you compare it with <laughs> today's travel, that was a bit slow. And um, um, as I said earlier, I think availability of, of vehicles. Well, we went back on the Aquitania, which had been a troop ship during the war. It was pretty rough, but still it got us home, so that was all right. And the other problem at the time was the Steve Dawes in New York were on strike. So we had to carry all that luggage. I remember strolling onto the boat with four suitcases, one under each arm and one under each hand. I couldn't do it now. Never <laughs> mind, we got home. And I forgot to ask you, Betty, what was, what was your job at the Pentagon? Did you do the same thing yes, than at Bletchley indeed. Park? Yes, the uh, paraphrasing. Part of the time, but after the uh, bomb had been dropped, of course, that was all finished. So I went back into Washington itself, and I was actually working with uh, Commander Denison's daughter. You know, Commander Denison was head of Bletchley at one time. And uh, there was a lot of clearing up to be done, so I helped with that. Um, there was nothing, nothing much else would could, one could do except wait for a passage. So you returned to Bletchley Park in October 45? Yes. That's what you said. Um, how did it feel when you returned there? Oh, it was like the end of a party. You know, that sort of dejected sort of look of everything. And, uh, um, well, it was just flat, nothing going on. There was nothing to be done anyway. I didn't do any work. I was only there for a few days and then I was posted down to an army unit in Surrey somewhere to wait for demobilisation. So when you say it was like a... Well, you know how you feel. A deserted you, party. A deserted party. Everything's, everything goes flat. That's, that's how I felt. People had left already? A lot of people had left, yes. It wasn't, in, it wasn't all instantaneous, but uh, people were beginning to pack up and go, yes. And after Bletchley Park, you went into Ludlow Grammar School, if yes, I... Yes, that's right, yes. Uh, well, after some weeks, I had a bit of a rest. And then, and the interesting thing there was, uh, because you're faced with uh, prospective employers who couldn't understand why you couldn't tell them what you've been doing during the war. It just, you know, completely blank looks on their faces. And uh, I missed a couple of jobs because of that. But it just so happened that the then headmaster, new headmaster of London Grammar School, had been at Bletchley. So we didn't say anything, but we understood. How long did you work for the army? Oh, altogether about 11 years, I think, yes. And just a very innocent question, how did it feel to wear the uniform? To feel to wear a uniform. Yes. Um, what was the feeling of yes, um, having a uniform on? Well, apart from the physical um, discomfort of it, because it was fairly basic and fairly tickly, I, I quite liked being uniform because, as I say, my father had been in the Army in the First World War, and uh, I think basically I, I enjoyed it. Yes, I did. Were you proud? Oh, yes. Very much so, yes. One had to be very smart and, uh, you know, your shoes had to be cleaned well. The one thing I didn't like about the training um, was the uh, day that we had to do gas mask training. That was within the basic training. Uh, this is horrifying, but um, they had a, <coughs> a small room where you were taken into with your gas mask on and then they released some gas and you took your gas mask off. Now this was to impress upon you that, <coughs> excuse me, that 
you did not disobey orders if you were told to put it on in the event of a raid. And believe me, it was jolly effective. Horrible. But that was part of basic training. Okay. Looking back at Bletchley Park, how do you feel about this time? When you think about Bletchley Park? Well, I'm extremely proud to have been involved. I still have a great interest in it and I'm in fact still working for Bletchley Park where I can. I give talks and I have given probably a couple of hundred over time. And um, I've been involved in events to do with uh, Bletchley Park. For instance, one, um, I thought, one very gratifying one was a television um, programme with um, a girl who was living in Belgium and she and her sister took two years to get out of Belgium while the war was on, uh, early part of the war, I don't exact dates, um, and they somehow or other got round Europe and got to England in the end and both joined up. And uh, they're both still alive actually, I saw one of them recently. Anyway, we did a presentation on, on the television and that was uh, another of my interests. But I mean that was an important thing for her because of her background. What was your reaction when you learned that those messages you had helped decoding had been communications between the worst of the worst? I'm talking about the Nazis and, you know. Well, there again, I mean, I'm glad I had, um, I was able to, to help with it. I didn't know what I was doing at the time, which I've probably said ad nauseum. But uh, this is the strange thing about um, being in, in a, a, an establishment where you can't talk about what, you, what you're doing. It's only much later when you can piece things together but, well, if it, if it helped, I'm, I'm jolly glad that I did. Um, to what extent? I don't know. I was only one of many and uh, maybe it was minimal, but it was something. What values in life did your experience at Bletchley Park give you as a human being? Um, communication, I think. Um, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I mean, interacting with people of all, from all walks of life, which is what Bletchley taught me, much more so than my life in the country. I mean, that's, that's something else. And today, Betty, how do you see the world we live in? Um, from the way it's portrayed over the media, pretty frightening. And I think it is frightening. I mean, awful things are happening at um, many levels. Um, I don't think I'm the only one either, um, but to me it's, it's a mess. And a dangerous mess. We've just got to get got to become more disciplined as human beings otherwise the whole thing's going to fall apart I know that sounds a bit perhaps a bit um, how can I put it um, defeatist I don't mean to be but uh, it is frightening communication is too fast people communicate without thinking and unfortunately, of course, if it hadn't been, <laughs> been for Bletchley, we might not have computers and so on. But we've got them. But they've got to be used in a disciplined way, in my view. Both in the home and, and, and in, in, in the public domain. Particularly the home. And the children, as I understand it, I don't have any close experience of this, but I understand that um, from various things we've seen on the media that 
children get into awful trouble by misusing and being misused by the internet. If I were somebody with neo-Nazi ideas, what would you say to me? It's difficult to put in a nutshell, but I suppose um, I'd be pretty scared if I thought you were a neo-Nazi to start with. And, um, well, I suppose I'd, I'd try and explain that I, I wouldn't think it was a good idea, but um, it would depend very much on the individual, I think, as to how I phrased it. Because it's awfully difficult to phrase something sensibly when you disagree with them, isn't it? as I had to do recently with an American friend. Do you want me to quote that one? I think I told you about it. No, it was very embarrassing. I, I um, was entertaining um, some Americans who are very Bletchley friendly and they came here for lunch before we went down to a reunion, fine. Um, but then the um, question of the present uh, man in charge came up and it seems uh, they thought he was the bee's knees, and I didn't. So I just said, well, I'm sorry, I don't know enough about American politics to, to comment. It's not fair for me to say anything. Left it at that. I mean, what else can you say? I didn't want to upset them. Do you think people are generally good, born with a positive, trusting worldview, or not? Well, that surely would depend on their surroundings, wouldn't it? Um, I don't know, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Do you think people are generally born with a positive, trusting worldview? Oh, well, they could be born with it because as a, as a child you don't know anything different. So, um, and a child is trusting. I mean, you can throw a child in the air and... and it, it doesn't doesn't cry. It, it it will be caught on the other side and and be none the wiser. But it's only much later in life that um, a child can form any opinion. You can't do it straight. You can't be born with it. So do you actually believe so? People are born generally good. Yes, I think so, unless they're unfortunate enough to have some medical condition which doesn't allow them to be anything else. We are seeing at the moment in Europe the rise of extreme right parties. What do you think of this? How do you perceive this? Well, I don't pretend to know an awful lot about it, but um, again, I think it's frightening in the same way that I said earlier about the um, fast communication being, being frightening. But I think it's unfair of me to make any real comment because I don't pretend to know that much about it. I'm aware of it. But I think I would have to go into it in much more depth to give a fair answer to that one. How do you see things moving forward? What do you hope for the future? Well, I hope for more discipline. Full stop. I mean, in every field. Because without discipline, everything will fall apart, in my view. What are you most fearful about? Well, this is fairly um, local uh, because I'm um, involved with um, someone who's having a very bad time. She's ill in bed and she's having a very bad time with carers. Now, this may be a national problem. I don't know whether it's international, but... Um, from what she tells me, some of the um, so-called carers are 
not caring. They're not trained sufficiently. This is maybe hearsay, but I, I do believe her. And um, I can imagine that um, some people would go into that position um, by caring. I mean going in and giving them meals and attending to other uh, wants um, by a bedridden person. And if they're not, if these carers are not trained professionally, who knows what they'll do? Have you, oh, my passion, not a listen. <laughs> so is it a critics that you may have on the way society goes today? There's a lack of caring, or there's a faulty caring, there's a lack of it's attention. Lack of it. Yeah, there's a definite lack, as I, as I see it. I haven't that much experience of it, but uh, I've had, a, a, <coughs> I suppose, several months of listening to this uh, individual who is um, very upset by it. What are you most hopeful about? What, generally speaking or personally? Both. Well, um, <laughs> my own point of view, I, I, I hope that I can stay well enough to keep on doing things. Um, but um, generally speaking, um, well, there's got to be a change of attitude, I think, in, in lots of fields. It comes back to this discipline thing, doesn't it? In your talks that you give, you get to meet people from different ages and backgrounds. Mm. How can you explain their interest in your experience? Um, well, um, see, what they want to know, what the audiences generally want to know is um, what went on at Bletchley and what I did there. Um, I mean, you get some funny questions that are totally unrelated, but <laughs> basically that's that's what they want to know. Because my audience is, apart from uh, some schools, I haven't had many schools lately, but I have had some, are mainly uh, middle-aged people and e even older. Um, so they're fairly, fairly uh, mature questions in the main. Very often, the audience, of, half the audience will have been to Bletchley anyway. Um, so that's good. We, you know, you can talk then without uh, having to explain in too much depth, because they've already seen the difficult bits. Because I don't pretend to know a great deal about the the machinery side. I give them an overall picture of, of what went on, and an overall picture of um, individual experiences. So clearly, this interest in Bletchley Park reveals something they they see Bletchley Park as something that maybe you might be able to describe us what would that represent what would that be that thing about Bletchley Park well it's basically the the fact that it it, um, it saved us from being overrun or it is said to have saved us from being overrun by possibly two years three who knows um, then, of course, the uh, the ones who are interested in the technical side of everything. Um, and they're the, those who just want to know how we lived. So I try and give them a bit of everything as far as I can. In your opinion, what should the word do in order to combat anti-Semitism, racism, any forms of harmful um, extremism? Well, I think it's an, an enormous task. And it probably comes down to, again, to, to discipline within each, each group of whoever is 
um, trying to upset things. I can't see how, it, what else you can do. It's education and discipline. It's got to be education. Otherwise they won't know what the alternatives are. How do you envision your contribution to this effort of education, for example? Oh, well, it's, it's very minimal. I mean, I can only, only give um, my experience and my interest. Um, I mean, I, I hope very much that by uh, um, giving these talks, limited as they are, um, will give the audience um, the drive to read more about it. I mean, there's, there's plenty of uh, plenty of literature, plenty of books have been written are, and are still being written on the subject, and it's there for those who want to um, enlarge on their on their knowledge. Is there anything you would like to add? Um, from the point of view of um, any, anything, right. Um, well, and only to say that I'm very glad that, despite the fact that I'm sad that we had to have a war, but I'm very glad that I was involved in it, um, because as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's been um, a very interesting life for me. Um, especially in my later years, because of all the talks and the events that have been related to British. I mean, there have been all sorts of uh, things that I've taken part in, including a, a three-day um, event down near Brighton, which was, was wonderful. We, had, we even had Alan Turing's um, nephew talking there and uh, one or two other well-known people in, in, in the Bletchley scene. And I was involved in that. I mean, that's been absolutely magic and a great privilege. In 2015, you were awarded the MBE. What was your feeling? Oh, I was absolutely delighted. And, and uh, the wording was um, uh, for remembering and promoting the work of Bletchley Park. That was, that was what it was for, Not, nothing to do with wartime, but, uh, what I'd been doing since. If you could say one thing to the present world and the future generations, what would it be? Well, I think in a rather sort of flippant way, um, travel as much as you can, when you can, and take advantage of, of any educational pursuits that come your way. I mean, quite apart from school, I mean, that, by the way. Um, and keep an interest in something and don't sit around and say there's nothing to do because that doesn't help, it's unhealthy. You must be involved in an interest with things and people. Join things, be part of a, an association of some sort, whatever it is. Keep your brain active, very important. Thank you, Mrs. Webb. My pleasure. Cameras rolling. Betty, can you explain to us what paraphrasing consisted of and could you give us an example? Yes, indeed. Well, it's quite a, a short one um, and the message reads, border areas near Kohima, which is in, in Burma, Imphal area expected to be attacked Monday. Now I would translate that in and paraphrase that into early next week attacks could be further west, maybe Kohima area. So slightly different meaning from the original yes, message. Yes, that's right, yes. So that anyone picking it up wouldn't be too sure whether or not we had 
broken the code. And going back to the original step of work, so you would intercept a message, then what happened next? Who would transcode it? It. Who would translate it? It. I mean, how, how did it work? Well, the, the whole process was um, the messages would be um, taken down by our signal people who were listening in to the enemy's um, Morse code messages because nothing was in the clear. It was all in Morse code. And then um, dispatch riders would bring the messages into Bletchley um, it be either by a dispatch rider or teleprinter. Um, I don't know what the um, reason for that was. Probably a necessity for speed, depending on where it could come from. Uh, but I don't know that for certain. Um, and then um, the next step would be to register all the messages in a way that uh, the decoders could call on any particular date or source because I think there was a, a, a very the only thing that was in the clear was the date and a, a sort of um, a code um, number which would mean something to the to the code breakers so that they would know which ones to to call for and then start on their decoding and then some another man or woman no be a man mainly to begin with um, to do the translating and then um, obviously a great deal of sifting had to be done I mean some of them would be weather reports it could be anything so there was a great deal of sifting uh, sifting to be done and then uh, obviously prioritizing depending on the the urgency of the message but that would have been done in another hut. So after the message being translated, mm. it was then onto the it was sent onto the registration department. Um, well, no, it would go to a group of people who would decide on the urgency of a message. I mean, some of them uh, might be trivial, something that could be left for a while. Others would be more urgent. It, uh, this this is uh, very difficult to define exactly where the messages went because of the variety of the content. So where were you at in this line of work um, when you were in the registration department? Well, I was I was simply registering the messages as they came in. I didn't have anything more important. Well, it was all important, but I didn't have anything at a higher level at that stage until I moved over to the... Um, well, I did little typing jobs and so on, but until the, whoever it was decided I was a good paraphraser. Whether we were given a test, I just don't know. And registration took place just after the message got intercepted yes, and uh, decoded? Um, well, yes. Uh, what sort of order, I don't know. I don't think there could be an order until it was decoded, because until then you wouldn't know the, the content and the urgency of it. I hope that explains a little bit. Thank you. Well, at least...